Good. I didn't do very good clap there. Sorry. No, no, that's, that's ah, the ah, only part of the job that's I my job. I get to do, no, I literally did. <laughs> I get to do the clapping. If you want to do it, you no, know. it's okay. Okay. So. All right. Tell me, first of all, when you first became aware of Powell and Pressburger's work and what kind of impact it had on you? Well, I think I was eight years old and I saw uh, The Red Shoes mm -hmm. and it's on its first release in America. Uh, my father took me to see it. Um, and it's a film that I that was a very strong impact on me, um, mainly because I, I think at that point, I, for many different reasons, but one of them could have been that the nature of the, of the, the storytelling, and that is the, uh, the images, the editing, camera movements, the use of music, the faces, all of this combined together in this very uh, uh, almost uh, uh, operatic story, um, and these bigger than life, over the top characters, um, very convincingly over the top, uh, from Montan Bolbrook to uh, Shara to uh, Ludmilla Charina and every uh, helpman, and, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Leonid Massine, all this other thing. All of this kind of added to, uh, uh, normally color uh, had to do with um, different types of pictures, westerns, musicals, the genre, yeah. the genre film. And this is 1948, mm -hmm. 49, so. I saw it maybe in 49 or 50. Um, and so it had a very strong impact on me because this, the nature, the, the, the story itself, although it had music and had spectacle in a sense, was a very dark story. Incredibly really. dark. Yeah, I, I, very surprising, very surprising. And then I became aware of, um, it was called in America, Stairway to Heaven, which I saw in black and white, of course, on television. Which obviously we know here is As a matter of life and death, and death yes. And then um, uh, the small back room which I saw on television one afternoon when I was homesick from school. Uh, very strange film. Uh, and uh, again, darker characters, um, somewhat disturbing themes. The relationship, the relationship, Kathleen Byron and uh, David Farrar's relationship, uh, very, very strong and very disturbing. Uh, also, the, in the intensity, the bomb diffusing squad, all of that was very, very powerful. Uh, and even rather over the top uh, uh, nightmare sequence. Yeah which was kind of shocking. Um, but um, uh, the other one that, <laughs> interestingly, that I became aware of was on television in, in New York. It was a show called The Million Dollar Movie, and they would show a film twice a night for a week. They, yeah. were, they, were, uh, they, they needed programming. And uh, one week was Citizen Kane, edited with commercials. <laughs> <laughs> with the march of time sequence missing so <laughs> first time i had seen it <laughs> uh, you know the third man half half cut out but um uh, one of the films was tales of hoffman yeah. and it was cut down to about an hour and 40 minutes or so black and white commercials and i just became aware of um uh it had a quality like the red shoes and of course it's the red, red shoes ballet uh, it expanded to two hours and 10 minutes whatever and it had this it had this uh, again a darkness to it uh, a humor, but also, um, for me, it was interesting the way the camera moved with the music and the sense of editing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. It did become a situation, because I lived in a tenement, and my mother and father and my brother, and uh, if it was on twice a night, I was, I'd be watching it, and, you know, at a certain point, my mother would ask, is it necessary to watch that again? <laughs> Sorry. But isn't it true that you would go and rent, there was a reel of it, that you would go and rent from a local store? Well, no, what happened when, um, in, I think it was early 60s, there was a chance to see it in color in a storefront on uh, uh, McDougall Street in the village, Greenwich Village. And uh, we went in there, maybe 10, 15 other people, that's it. And it was a 16 millimeter Technicolor print, it was gorgeous, with the entire last sequence edited out. And people were furious, and the poor, the job, and these, these were places that were, these were places that were showing up, 16 millimeter projector, with um, uh, showing. Up, at that point, it was very difficult to see certain films, uh, everything from uh, Paul Pressburger's to early David Lean films to early Hitchcock to uh, oh uh, Howard Hughes films. You couldn't see, but some people had 16 millimeter copies. William K. Everson did too. For example, at New York University, and he would show Hell's Angels, uh, directed by Howard Hughes and Howard Hawks, and that's sort of whatever. But in any event, we'd seek these things out just as cur not only as curiosity, but for the sense of completion. What was it that was so compelling about these pictures? I mean, yes, Tales of Hoffman takes lots of chances. Uh, it doesn't always succeed, but it's a remarkable, remarkable film and, and a sense of film as music, the yeah. composed film. Um, 
and uh, is, a, is a very, very, uh, very important picture to me. Finally, we saw black narcissus, but in black and white. <laughs> so, in a sense, having grown up with um, American, um, British, and uh, neorealist Italian films, um, mainly the, the, the British filmmakers that I really didn't even know exist, if they existed or not, were, were Michael Powell and Emmett Pressburger. Um, and uh, it was really difficult to see their films, and uh, it took a while to actually believe that they, we at one point thought myself, and some, actually some high-placed film critics thought there were pseudonyms. Oh, right, for, okay. for, but there was very little written yeah. about the British cinema, except for Paul Rotha and a number of others, but that was before their pictures. From a filmmaker's point of view, what does that film say to you? I mean, it is a film which talks exactly about the voyeuristic gaze being, being murderous, cinema itself being dangerous. Tell me how that makes you... I, you know, obviously the kind of pictures I make, I mean, I'm drawn to that type of material. That's... I respond to it. But, you know, when you make a film or when you... There's a times in your life when you're uh, burning with a passion, in a sense, uh, you don't have to express it. You could be expressing it in a very quiet way, but it's still there. And it's very, very strong. And um, it's almost like a pathology of, of cinema, where you want to possess the people on film. You want to possess, you want to live through them. And you want to possess them as, you want to possess their spirits, their souls, in a way. And ultimately, you can't stop. It has to be done until you get to the bitter end, the very, very, very end. You're exhausted. In some cases, friends might have died. In some cases, they don't come back. In some cases, they can't make another picture. The only thing to do is try to make another picture. It's got to be done again. Not, I mean, to sound, if it sounds dramatic, a lot of great films are made that way. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it might not, I might, only, might not only be talking about cinema. I'd be talking about other things, too. I would think it might apply to other art forms, but... I must say, with that passion and that power, there is a pathology of wanting to, to have that, to, to live vicariously through the people. How does that pathology express itself in your work? Well, I think in my own work, um, the, the subject matter usually uh, deals with um, characters I know, aspects of myself, friends of mine, and that sort of thing, and we try to work it out. Work it out meaning uh, almost like... Uh, work it through your system, particularly Mean Streets of a Taxi Driver from Schrader's script and uh, Raging Bull, particularly, uh, where I think we, le I le we left, I left anyway, De Niro was fine at the end of it, but I left Jake LaMotta's character more at peace with himself than I was with myself. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping to get to that moment that he was, at the end of the film, looking in the mirror at that moment when he was looking in the mirror, I was hoping to get there myself. Um, I hadn't made it. And uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of living through, through the cinema, I think. So for you, was the experience of seeing Peeping Tom, which deals so explicitly with that pathology you're talking about, did you find that a cathartic experience? Did you find it an experience which chimed with you? Um, quite honestly, uh, y y you know, it, I don't know. At the time, it was, it was very difficult to analyze films. I couldn't really analyze them. We absorbed them, in a way. Um, it certainly wasn't cathartic. It was inspiring in the sense that someone else has said it. Someone else has actually almost, you know, spoken the unmentionable, really, in a sense that the, um, uh, the similar with that and Eight and a Half, really, the yeah. two films about filmmaking that are very, very uh, truthful, I think. Um, the essence of uh, uh, cinema, the danger that one could become obsessed with, um, and that's all aspects of it, too. And the film is very interesting because all the, the fetish ideas are there. All the elements of the projector is correct. The lens is right. Mm -hmm. The sprockets are correct. The sound of the sprockets are correct. You go, you do, you do. There is a point at, in time, many times over the years, where I love to hear the sound of film going through a projector. And I can tell you if it's 35 or 16. You know, now that's gone, of course. But um, uh, there's a certain... Uh, uh, kind of a going into a trance almost in a way or, or I should say a meditation of some kind it depends what you do with it you know and it has to come out other ways and for me it was burning to be able to express myself with cinema um, and be, be inspired by films like this because he broke the ground really he, um, 
he overstepped the line at that time. Don't forget that was the same year that Psycho came out. Yeah. And Psycho was badly panned in America. I don't know about England, but it was badly panned in America. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a film that really, really stands up, Psycho, I think. Uh, not the murder scenes, but the, uh, and the murder scenes are quite, quite interesting, but it's the character, character scenes that are really brilliant. There's no doubt, I think it goes back to Red Shoes and uh, when I finally saw Matter of Life and Death in Color. Um, there's, there's no doubt, I mean, the, the, the sense, uh, in some cases, I could, you could say there's a, um, it, what I saw growing up, those were the colors, uh, when there was color. Normally it was uh, hallways with single light bulbs and that sort of thing. It was mainly black and white mm -hmm. in a way, but when it was color, it was harsh, strong, some would say lurid colors. And I come from a period, a, gr a period of, um, how should I say, uh, for formative years in the 50s. Those uh, paperback covers, um, the, uh, the popular novels, all that sort of thing, that was just splashed all across, you know, uh, Raoul Walsh's Battle Cry. I mean, films like that were splashed all over uh, the, the consciousness of the, of the, um, the film-going public, you know, and um, the popular culture. And so it was very strong, very strong images in my head. Okay. But I came from a place like that. Mm. And so it was just very natural to see men, uh, artists on the level of Powell and Pressburger, and Michael himself in this case, uh, using colors in such a brash, uh, I guess you would say expressive way, you know, and taking a chance with that. Because colors, are, they are pretty strong in, in, the, East, in, in the, Eastman, the use of Eastman color in that film. When you talk about um, the, the, the fetish of film, and I mean, it's, it's a subject that many filmmakers return to is the subject of actually making films. Well, now you're doing Hugo Cabaret, which obviously is about, you know, it's Melia, it's, yes. it's the functionality of film, it's the, the automatons. Do you see We were that just shooting that today. We're, oh. just, we're just shooting Melier's films today. And tell me about, therefore, working with the idea of a filmmaker making films about the mechanics, the birth of cinema. Life. Well, I think in this case, it's really the story of a little boy, Hugo Cabret, but he does become friends with the older George Melies, who was, who was discovered at the uh, Gaye de Montparnasse in 1927 or 28, uh, working at a toy store, um, completely bankrupt, etc. But and then, and then uh, uh, re, re, um, um, uh, completely revived, in a way. He had a beautiful gala in 1928 and, in Paris. Um, and in the film, the, the, the cinema itself is the connection, the automaton, the machine itself. The machine itself is the emotional connection between the boy, his father, uh, Melies, his family, and all, all, how it all comes together, how people express themselves using uh, the technology. Um, emotionally and psychologically um, how they it's the connection between the people and the thing that's missing how it supplies what's missing very often I've known people who wouldn't say a word to each other to go see movies together and experience life that way so for you in much the same way as the central character in Peeping Tom the camera is the the link with the with the world whether it's you know aggressive yes. or yes yeah now that may change over time and uh, it may change over time with people but there is no doubt that it's uh, it's aggressive, and uh, it, it could be something that is um, uh, not very healthy. Um, again, hence the the unhealthy nature, the look of this film, the the uneasy feeling of it, the the use of color, uh, uh, the sleaziness of the the models, all of that. It feels unhealthy, and she says, you know, uh, all this filming is unhealthy. Uh, a friend of mine sent me that note when we were doing Raging Bull. <laughs> As Marty, because they'd just seen Peeping Toms, and they, the first they wrote back. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was one of the. I think it was one of the uh, film, uh, one of the cinematographers. But it was um, uh, that, and moments where she says, "Take me to your cinema." Uh, it's very moving. See, that problem with the film at the time probably was that you have this serial killer, basically horrible, yet he's presented um, as someone who's very who touches you in a way. It's very moving. It's different from M, where Peter Lorre finally blows at the end, blows up at the end, and he explains it all. He talks about how he feels and what, and it, that's a twist, and that's a t uh, uh, something that's rather shocking in another way. Here, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, something about his eyes and his quiet, and especially when he photographs those models, it's a kind of uneasy um, empathy with this person. And I think it shocked people. Um, uh, many critics uh, really, as you know, reacted violently against it because they don't want the, they don't want those parts of themselves touched. 
Maybe yeah, maybe, maybe they don't want to maybe they don't want to face that part of themselves if they have that. A lot of people do. Let me ask you, uh, one of the things, you know, you're shooting now in 3D. Yes. One of the ideas of, uh, of a Peeping Tom is, you know, the, the camera pointing out the tripod. Yeah. I mean, firstly, how have you found 3D to work? Well, I've always liked 3D. I was uh, 11 or 12 years old when I did, uh, when, when the first 3D craze had, had occurred back in, uh, in the 50s. Uh, but I'm finding this one, um, uh, it's really, every shot is rethinking cinema, rethinking narrative, how to tell a story with a picture. I mean, we're sitting here, we're in 3D. Why not? I mean, we are in 3D. We see in 3D, you know? I don't say we have to keep throwing javelins at the camera. <laughs> I don't use it as a, I'm not saying we use it as a gimmick. But the idea of the machine itself in the film, the clocks, the camera, uh, and the 3D itself, which is at times almost incomprehensible to me how the machine works. But, um, but I, 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 it's liberating and um, um, it's um, uh, literally a Rubik's Cube every time you go out to uh, design a shot and work on a, work on a camera move or a crane move. Uh, luckily we're working in studios and, and it's that kind of film lends itself to it. But um, it has a beauty to it also. People look like moving statues. They move like, like, they move like sculpture, like as if sculpture was moving in a way like dancers. You could see, you could feel. It reminds you of the, when uh, uh, the, there was a, a, a book recently on, um, on Picasso and um, Brock, how um, inspired they were by early cinema. And Meliers and many, many of the filmmakers, Lumiere brothers and that, they go see everything every week in Paris. And one of the things, uh, just generally, uh, talking about this uh, paraphrasing it really, but um, one, of the, one of the ideas was that you can see a person all sides of the person, they can turn. The painting can't, in a way. Mm -hmm. So you have then the cubism, where the person is. Uh, and if you look closely at some of the the portraits in the, uh, from cubism, uh, in cubism at the time, we were, um, as one or two, I forget the names, but um, it's it's, uh, it's a portrait of a woman, but uh, it uh, is really a projector. Uh, and it's it's quite interesting how they were fascinated by um, this art form. As somebody who has such a profound sense of cinema and the space that you're talking about there, the three dimensions, I mean, how do you reconcile that with, for example, you know, a Boardwalk Empire, the small screen work you've done, which has been incredibly successful? Well, Boardwalk Empire is, uh, uh, that's a kind of epic spectacle of, a, of American uh, history culture, I should say, American culture. And it's a period which uh, my parents, well, it was, I was in the 1950s and 1920s, it was only 30 years earlier. It's as if we're talking now about what? The 1980s, early 80s, late 70s. We are talking about that. That was like yesterday to me. So the 20s, in my head, was very, very um, present uh, because my parents always referred to it, the music, the people, the clothes. I know all the songs. I know everything. Well, the films, we knew it all. And, uh, and so it was a natural uh, transition. But I, I, I really was fascinated by the idea of taking, of working with Terry Winter and those guys and taking these characters over 13 hours uh, develop, developing them, the story, the complications of American um, uh, corruption, American uh, politics and uh, gangsters and that sort of thing in Atlantic City, very interesting place before Vegas. Um, uh, and and um, it, it is made for the, um, uh, I guess you would say the small screen, but they aren't that small anymore. Uh, and so it made it like a film. It made it like an epic B film in yeah. a way. Are you doing the Goodfellas prequel? Um, I'm Mitch not Blake. sure yet. I'm not sure we're talking to Erwin Winkler about it, yeah. But it might happen. Yeah. Okay. A few more things about, um, I'm aware the time is running out, about Peeping Tom. What, how did you preserve Peeping Tom's legacy? What did you practically do to make, to put Peeping Tom back into the public? Well, my assistant field? at the time, in 1979, came to me and said, uh, hey, you know, there's uh, Peter Meyer of Corinth Films has access to the, uh, the rights of Peeping Tom. He said, if you give us um, $5,000 to... Uh, uh, help redistribute the picture, um, you know, that would be amazing. It would be at the New York Film Festival. We can get it in there. I said, great. What, what, what would you want for us? Just a print, a 35 millimeter print. And that's what we got. Um, but it opened at the New York Film Festival. And um, Michael, I, I brought him over to America. I had met Michael in, in, in London in 76, I think, or so, and became friends with him. And, came back and forth uh, to uh, New York and L.A. 
And um, he came over to America and uh, did some press for the film, and it was playing in the, the Quad Cinema in New York and went all over the, all over the country. Um, generally, to very, very good reviews and a really interesting reception. And um, that's, that's ultimately how it, how it all came about, really. Yeah. After the horror of its initial release, how did he feel about the fact that you effectively rehabilitated it? Because it was so traumatic well, the first time. I didn't... I remember him... He went down to the Quad Cinema, which is down in, I don't know, 12th Street somewhere, downtown Manhattan. And it's a very small place. And when he came back up, he said there was... It's... It's... Uh, he could hear the cries of it like a newborn baby on the street. Born again. Born again. Um, it's a very... Very interesting, uh, very interesting turn to take in his career. Make a picture like that with Leo Marx, by the way, who's an amazing writer, and uh, you, you, know, you know his his story. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, from your point of view, in that case, having reintroduced it, I mean, it then being accepted because of your you know very close relationship with Michael Powell, did you feel that you had sort of? I mean, it feels like it's repaying a great debt to sort of rehabilitate that movie because it had such bad treatment when it was first released. I, I'd hoped it wasn't... It's not like expecting anything from it. It was wanting to share it with those who would appreciate it. Not everybody would, I guess, but there are many who, who would. Uh, it's different. It has a very strong emotional and psychological core that's different from, uh, um, quite honestly, uh, films that are, uh, horror films of today, for example. Many of them. I don't say all, but many. Uh, and so um, I think that's what really was so disturbing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last thing, is it one of your favorite films of all time? Yes, it is, yeah, because it, it still speaks to me. I mean, even when I was seeing the, the, uh, the transfers, the color the transfer, um, with sound, without sound, I'm still surprised at how um, at times disturbingly beautiful it is. Thank you very much. Thank you.